Welcome to my session today. Um, I'm going to be talking about Vertex 2. Uh, my name's Tim Fox. Um, I'll say a few words about myself to start off with. The obligatory bio slide. Um, I'm employed by Red Hat currently, um, where I, I lead the Vertex project. Before that, I was working at VMware for a while. I worked with the RabbitMQ team. Um, and before that, I was at Red Hat again. So I kind of went from Red Hat to VMware, then back to Red Hat again. Um, in my previous existence at Red Hat, I, was, um, I led messaging development there. Um, so basically, one of the things I did there was the Hornet Q messaging system. It's creator of that. Um, it works a bit on JBoss application server. Hornet Q is the messaging system at the heart of JBoss app server and in the JBoss enterprise application platform, which is their main product, um, and a few other open source projects. But bios are available online if you're interested in that kind of thing. But we're here to talk about Vertex. So today, I'm going to, the agenda for today is going to be basically, actually, first of all, how many people are familiar with Vertex? How, that, right, OK. So most of you are already familiar with Vertex, which is good. So what, I, what I'm going to do is kind of a recap a bit about kind of overview of Vertex, what it does for those of you who aren't. And then I'm going to kind of go into more of the kind of new features in Vertex 2, um, some of the new cool stuff. And I've got about five or six little demos as well to do, kind of make things a bit more interesting. So first, let's get the boring stuff out of the way. Project Info. Um, yeah, so Vertex is an independent community project. It's not owned or controlled by any one company. This is a really good thing. Um, it means you know, we, are, we have quite a lot of contributions from you know, a wide range of organizations and individuals. Earlier in the year, we transitioned across to the Eclipse Foundation, um, which is great. So the main project Vertex is now living over at the Eclipse Foundation. And we have kind of the whole umbrella of other stuff that's living in GitHub still. Um, yeah, so it's all on GitHub, open source. Do I even need to say that these days? I mean, how many projects that are being talked about in this conference are not open source? Probably not very many. Um, yeah, and we're one of the most popular Java projects on GitHub right now, which is good. OK, so a bit of an overview, first of all. So what is Vertex? If, I was just, if people, someone to ask me, what is Vertex, what would I say? Well, it's a lightweight, reactive application platform. And you've probably heard this term reactive being thrown around quite a lot now. It's kind of buzzword at the moment. Um, so when we say reactive, we're generally meaning kind of event-driven systems, so responding to events and you know, non-blocking systems. It's not all of what reactive is, but that's kind of a, one of the main factors. Vertex is polyglot. Um, so this is kind of a unique feature amongst the reactive platforms out there at the moment, I believe. I don't think any others are actually polyglot. Um, so you know, we, and I will talk more about this in the next slide. So we currently support several JVM languages. Very high performance, um, yeah, unsubstantiated claims, I know, but we are going to have some um, results out, hopefully not too long. But it is a very high performance um, framework. And superficially similar to Node.js. So, you know, yeah, that's kind of true. Um, a lot of people think of Vertex as Node.js for the JVM, OK? And it is true to a certain extent. Um, you know, we're both reactive systems, reactive platforms. But Vertex goes further than, than Node.js. It does more stuff. We have a kind of distributed event bus, which is a really important feature. Um, and of course, we're not just JavaScript. So JavaScript's great. And I like JavaScript for, you know, for particular jobs, but not for every job. Um, so with Vertex, you don't have to do just stick with JavaScript. And we're faster than Node.js, too, which is a bonus. Yeah, so Polyglot. So right now, you can use, inside your Vertex application, you can use Java, JavaScript, Ruby, Groovy, and Python. And we've got beta level support for Clojure, Scala, and PHP. Um, so you know, already today, so when I say supported, I don't mean kind of like you know, commercial support or anything. I mean, as in, you know, we have full documentation for it and all that kind of stuff. Um, so the Scala stuff's particularly interesting. Um, it's not quite yet there, not quite that there yet, but um, it's getting there. There's not really any documentation, but you can use it today, and that's going to be a really important kind of direction going ahead. Yeah, so at the core of Vertex, we have this thing, you know, we have what we call Vertex core. And the core is very small and static. And that's the kind of, we want to keep it that way. We don't envision a lot of new functionality arriving in the core. We do have a few new things in there. 
So, you know, when you write a Vertex application, you write it against the core asynchronous APIs. And we provide stuff like, you know, TCP, clients and servers, HTTP, clients and servers, WebSockets, um, SockJS, file, asynchronous file system, asynchronous event bus, which is a really important feature. I'm going to go into a lot more detail in that in a minute with some demonstrations. We've got some new DNS and UDP support that Norman Mara has, um, has dropped uh, recently. Norman's the other core team member of Vertex. He's also a member of the Netty team. We have a very um, close relationship with the Netty team. Um, yeah, so you know, the, the, at the core, we don't envision that changing much over time. We want most new functionality to arrive in the form of modules, which I'll discuss later on. So why asynchronous? Why have we decided to you know, have asynchronous APIs? You know, we don't want to do it unless we really have to do that, OK? Because arguably, asynchronous APIs are harder to program against, are harder to reason about, harder to test, harder to debug. That's not always true, actually. But there is a point there. And in many cases, it is true. So we don't want to do it unless we really have to do it. So why is that? And it's all about scaling with, with, you know, scaling with the new generation of applications, which have to support many, many connections. Clearly, you know, you're talking about well, examples would be you know, web servers, Internet of Things, which was discussed earlier. You know, we may have an MQTT server, um, web sockets. All these are kind of long-lived connections, right? So the modern servers, they need to support many, many, many long-lived connections, maybe millions of connections. And clearly, a thread per connection model doesn't work there. Operating system threads are a lot more lightweight than they used to be, but there's still a fair amount of overhead, both in terms of the stack, the RAM required for the stack, Context switching overhead too. Um, and you can't probably have a million threads. So that, that leads us to a non blocking model, and that feeds through into the design of our APIs. So our APIs have a non blocking asynchronous approach too. Now you might ask, well, we could use continuations or something in order to give a direct style API, but still you know, not actually block an operating system thread. Um, but, jet, but continuations aren't supported well, or they aren't supported at all on the JVM. And you can only do it by all sorts of nasty hacks, like um, you know, basically re rewriting your code in, 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 in a different form. So that doesn't really work. So that's why we have asynchronous API. The vertical, right. So in your vertex program, the heart of the vertex program is a set of what we call verticals. And these are the execution units of vertex. And they're basically you know, just little bits of code that you run. And one thing that um, characterizes them is they're strictly single-threaded. Um, actually, that's not quite true. There are, there are cases when verticals can be multi-threaded, but that's kind of a, not a core feature. But you can, in most cases, they're single-threaded. So this is a, it's an immediate win for the developer. You don't have to worry about synchronized, volatile, you know, explicit locking. You can wave goodbye to whole you know, classes of race conditions that, would, that you would perhaps have in, in more familiar Java multi-threaded code. So you have your application built up of all these verticals, and they communicate with each other by passing messages between them. Okay? So you scale by having, not by having more threads going through your vertical, but by having more verticals utilizing the cores on your machine. So you might be thinking, it sounds a bit like the actor model. If you're familiar with the actor model, perhaps, from Erlang, or maybe from um, Acker, two good examples. And it is, it is very similar. I mean, it's, we don't, we're, not a, we're not strictly an uh, actor implementation, but in terms of concurrency, we take a very similar approach. Um, and there's nothing wrong with the actor model. OK. So let's do a little, dem little demo of, um, I'll, show you a, I'll show you a couple of verticals to start with. Start off simple, and we'll get more complicated. So in this directory here, um, can, you, can you all see that at the back? Good. OK. So. I've got here a JavaScript vertical called Hello World JS, which is a simple, um, it's basically just a Hello World HTTP server, which, which displays um, some static HTML. So let's have a quick look at that. As you can see, very, very simple. You know, it's a few lines of code. We're creating an HTTP server. We're setting a request handler on that server. The request handler we set is just a function, and that function will be called when a request arrives on the server. And when that happens, we're just going to say Hello World from JavaScript. OK? Let's run that. Now, in Vertex, you can run what we call raw verticals. So little verticals like that you can run directly from the command line if you wish. 
Um, for more complex applications, they're normally composed of, of many verticals. So we recommend you package stuff into modules instead. But for the purposes of a demo or you know, prototyping, it's fine to just run verticals directly in the command line. So you can just do vertex run hello world JS. Okay. And we go to a browser. Oops. It's not auto completing for me. And there we go. Simple enough. Now let's have a look at this exactly the same vertical written in Java. And I've got an example here hello world.java. Oh, wrong one. Capital. OK. And as you can see, it's a bit more verbose. Obviously, it's Java. So that's going to be the case. And it's, pre it's pretty much doing the same thing. It's basically sending back a static string, hello world, from Java. So let's run that. So how would you run that? Let vertex run hello world dot Java. You notice I'm not compiling. I'm not pre-compiling the Java first. Um, so this is a really nice feature of that. You can run Java files directly, and it will do the compilation on the fly for you. Again, this is really useful for kind of prototyping purposes, but you can do it in real applications too. Um, so you don't have to worry about compiling your classes, putting them in a directory, constructing a class path, all this kind of stuff. You just do vertex. Oh, if I can actually spell vertex right. Vertex run hello world.java. There you go. Uh, F5. And there it is. So that's basically a simple vertical. So what we run there is two very simple verticals. In itself, um, not particularly interesting. OK. I mentioned before this thing called the event bus. Um, so the event bus is the nervous system of vertex. So verticals by themselves aren't really much, you know, much use. They need to talk to each other. So the event bus is the thing over which they talk, how they send messages. So you can think of the verticals a bit like the actors, Right? And the event bus is the way you transfer messages between them. And the event bus itself is a lightweight um, asynchronous messaging system. We support um, publish, subscribe messaging, all the common mes messaging patterns, point to point messaging, request response messaging. Um, you can pass strings, um, buffers, byte arrays, primitive types. But what we recommend is you use JSON. You don't have to use JSON, it's not a rule, but we recommend it. And the reason is, it's all about because of the polyglot nature of vertex. So we need, you know, what is the lingua franca of all the verticals, of all the languages? You know, if you have a Ruby vertical talking to a Java vertical, talking to a Scala vertical, you know, if we had a kind of complex binary protocol, it'd be kind of hard to pass and you know, and hard to, to reason about. So we use JSON because JSON is well understood by all those languages. So that's a kind of convention to use JSON. Now, so the event bus is used you know, to transfer messages from one vertical to another. But it goes further than that. It's a clustered event bus, too. So if you have multiple instances of Vertex running on your network, they, they can be all cluster together to form a great big distributed event bus over which you can send your messages. So you take it a step further. And we end up with a lightweight peer-to-peer -peer messaging system. It connects all your, all your multiple Vertex JVM instances. And it leads us to the kind of way that Vertex applications design. We're, go, we're moving away from a kind of application server model, where you have this kind of monolithic application server living somewhere, and you're deploying stuff into it. Instead of doing that, you're having lots of little components, perhaps, you know, perhaps doing one thing and one thing only, living on different parts of your network, potentially, as appropriate, perhaps written in different languages according to the job at hand. Some languages are better at some things than others. And, and perhaps also according to the skill set of your teams, and communicating each, with each other over the event bus to form your application. So there's no application server there. And this kind of brings me back to one of the core design things of Vertex was um, simple but not simplistic. So we want, you know, basically, we wanted to get away from the perceived complexity of you know, the traditional application platforms at the time the complex XML config and having to deploy things into app servers. So the idea is to give the developer the power to write real applications with just a few lines of code and just run them, not have to kind of deploy them into things and kind of package them up in complicated ways. Anyway, back to the event bus. So the cluster manager that we use, um, so we have this idea of a cluster manager, which is the thing that handles the group communication between the nodes. 
And that's actually pluggable. The default implementation we use um, uses Hazelcast, which is that you, um, you may have heard, I think there have been talks about Hazelcast in this conference, which is a great little um, clustering library. But that's totally pluggable. You could plug in you know, JGroups, InfiniSpan, Zookeeper, whatever you wanted by implementing a few interfaces. OK, so let's um, actually let's take it one step further. Before we go into the demo, I'm going to show you a demo in a minute, a three-part demo. So you know, we've got this vision of all your application formed of multiple components in different places in your server talking to each other over the event bus. But we can extend that into client-side JavaScript, too. And the idea is you can use the same API, sending and receiving messages on the event bus, inside your browser, too. So, this, so you end up with this kind of really powerful distributed event space that spans not only everywhere on your server, but you know, on your browsers too. So you can, browsers can talk to other browsers, browsers can talk to servers, servers can talk to browsers. Everything is a peer on the network. And this is ideal for this kind of like new breed of so-called real-time web applications. By, re by real-time here, I kind of mean, I don't mean the kind of computer science stricter definition of real-time that I was brought up to, uh, to understand. I mean the kind of new definition of real time, which basically just means pushing stuff from the server to clients. OK, so let's have a little demo. Right, so let's go into the event bus directory. Let's have a look at the event bus working. So what I've got here in this directory is <clears throat> I've got a few verticals. I've got a, um, to start with, I've got a vertical called receiver.js. And this is a, a simple JavaScript vertical. We can have a look at that. Uh, Receiver.js. Very, very trivially simple. All it's doing is it's subscribing to an address on the event bus. And when it receives data on that address, it's just going to log that out to the, to the command prompt. It's just a very simple example of publish, subscribe, messaging to subscribe part of it. So let's run that. Vertex run. Receiver.js. Now, I'm going to use this switch here, minus cluster. And what this does, this tells Vertex that when it starts up to also look out for any other Vertexes that might start up on the same network. And if they do, to cluster them together, start talking to each other. Now, right now, I've only got receiver.js running, so nothing much is going to happen. So let's go to a different command prompt. And I've got another uh, vertical here called sender.java, which is written in Java, unsurprisingly. Um, and this is just going to be every second, um, it's going to, a timer is going to fire. And when it fires, it's going to publish a string, news from Java, to that address. So let's run that. And we're going to um, use the cluster switch again. So hopefully these two separate JVM instances will talk to each other. And this would work whatever node, wh wherever they were on your network as long as they could see each other on the network. And as you can see, the receiver's now picking up that news. So let's take that a step further. I open another command prompt. And let's try and actually publish that to client-side JavaScript too. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, start up. Well, if we're going to put it to client-side JavaScript, we need to serve a page. So we need a web server for a start. Right? So what we've got here is a little web server. Again, it's a vertical written in Vertex. And I'll just show you that. Uh, bridge server Java. Again, very simple uh, web server. And it's just creating a web server. And it's going to serve a couple of static resources. One of them is the index HTML page that we're gonna, we need. And also the JavaScript client side library for Vertex. And it does one other thing down here. It creates something called a SockJS server. And what this does, sorry, a SockJS bridge. And what this does, it kind of bridges the server-side um, event bus to the client-side into, into the actual browser. So let's run that. Vertex run, bridge server.js. Uh, and we're going to use the cluster switch again. And let's go to the browser, F5. Oh, and it's not working. Unexpected. Let me just have a, maybe the network's not 
functioning properly. Let's run it again just to make sure. Ah, demonstrations, eh? idea what was happening there to be honest but it should have it should have popped up in the browser I have to move along it should have popped up in the browser um, uh, yes of course very very well spotted so how do I connect to the I, I need to connect to the, to the network What a stupid mistake that was. <laughs> OK. Are we... OK. This is the kind of thing you don't want to do in the middle of a live demo and <laughs> a demonstration. Uh, so go to any old site, I guess. And uh, lowercase. All right. Please work. Yeah, I had a few issues in my machine setting up as well, so it kind of threw me a little bit. Um, right. We're we still not connected. There we are. Ah, there we go. So it does work. Honestly, I wasn't lying. Right. Apologies for that. Yeah, so what you can see there is the client-side JavaScript is now picking up. We have exactly the same code in the, in the, in the browser, which is picking up the stuff that's being pushed from the server. So we end up with this kind of distributed event space, distributed messaging system, if you like, that spans not just your server-side nodes, but your client-side nodes, too. OK. So let's move on to modules. Another really important thing that we really built on in Vertex 2 is modules, the module system. So we had a module system before in Vertex 1, but it's kind of um, basic. So in Vertex 2, we've really expanded the module system. This is the kind of really key thing um, that's going to be very important for moving Vertex onwards. So what is a module? A module in Vertex encapsulates the code and resources of your application. And for a typical application, maybe for a small application, you may only have one um, module. For a larger application, you may make it into several modules. One thing about a module, it has something called a mod JSON descriptor file in it, which is a bit basically a text file that contains some JSON, which describes stuff about the module. And in the case of a runnable module, a module can be runnable or non-runnable. A runnable module, um, you have a field called main, which points to the vertical that's run when you execute the module. And another thing that modules provide is class loader isolation. So um, it allows you to do stuff like, say you had three modules in your application, and one of them used you know, version 3 of Netty, another one used version 4 of Netty, they'd still be able to run inside the same JVM, inside the same application, inside the same JVM at the same time. So let's take a quick look at some modules. So I've got here, oops, caps lock. Um, I've got here a directory. Um, actually, let me just copy it over. OK, I've got a directory here called mods. And by default, when you run a module in Vertex, the first place it looks for the module is a directory called mods in your local directory. This, is, you know, this can be overridden, but that's the default behavior. So I've already got a module in there that I prepared earlier. So let's have a look at that. And you can see inside there, there's a directory 
that's called io.vertex. It's got three parts, io.vertex, hello mod, one zero. This is the convention for naming a module. And it's a bit like, if you're familiar with Maven, it's a bit like kind of Maven coordinate. The first part is a kind of group ID, second part's the name, the third part's the version. So let's have a look in that module. What have we got there? We've got two things. This is a very trivially simple module. Um, we've got a vertical called hello world.groovy. Modules can contain more than one vertical. In this case, there's only one. And again, this is just the same example from before um, of a very trivial web server providing some static HTML, this time written in Groovy for, for variety. And we've got a file called modjson there. Right? Um, so let's have a look at that. And this has just got a, a field called main that's pointing at that vertical. So when you run the module, it's just telling it which you know, vertical to run. So let's run that. How do we run that? Right. To run a module, you instead of vertex run, you say vertex run mod. And then the name of the module. Uh, hello mod, if I remember correctly. One zero. OK. Oh, and it's not the name of the module, at least. One zero. OK. Then to type, it might help. Vertex run mod io.vertex hello mod one zero. Okay, what's it doing now? Ah, I know what that is because we've already got a server running over here at the same hosting port. So we just shut that down first. Now start it again. Okay. So that's how you run a module. We'll go back to our browser, F5, hello world from Groovy. OK, simple. Now let's do something a bit more interesting. So let's delete that mods directory, rm minus rf mods. And let's try and run that same vertical again using the same command line we just used. Let's see what happens. Oh, something seems to have happened. Let's go back to browser F5. Oh, it's still running. So what actually happened there was I said before that Vertex will look, the first place it will look for a module is a local mods directory. But in that case, we didn't have a local mods directory because I deleted it. So what it will then do by default, um, it will then look in various other places for modules. And one of the places it will look is in Maven Central. So it just so happened that I put that module a few days ago in Maven Central. So when I ran it then, it went to Maven Central, it pulled it down. It unzipped it locally, and then it ran it. And Vertex will understand, um, Vertex 2 understands not only all Maven repositories, it understands bin tray repositories, which is the new, you may have heard of bin tray. It's a new kind of um, binary, GitHub style binary um, place to put your binaries. And it will, under, it will also understand local Maven repositories. OK. So a bit more on modules. So where are we going with modules? So the idea is we're going to, we want to encourage an ecosystem of modules. We want to encourage the community to create modules, to share them, so that people can, when they're writing their Vertex applications, they can, because Vertex, the platform itself, is very unopinionated. We don't say, this is how you write a web application. We don't say, this is how you write an enterprise application. We don't really, we're very unopinion, unopinionated about it. What we envisage happening is a whole set of modules being available. So when you want to write a, say, a REST-style web application, you can go, oh, I'm going to take this module, this module, this module, and this module, piece them together, you've got your application. Or I want to write a real-time-style web application, I'm going to take these other ones instead. Or maybe I want to write a kind of back-end enterprise application, I'll take these other modules instead. So that's why we support Maven and Bintray, because we don't want to re reinvent the wheel. We don't, we don't want to create another repository format. We realize that most of you are already using Maven, most likely, already. So that's why I want to support that. Vertex will resolve modules at build time or runtime. So we, already, we just showed it resolving modules at runtime. Now, not everybody wants to do that. Some people want to package everything up at build time. And we support that, too. And I'll show you that in a minute. Um, so yeah, the vision is to encourage an ecosystem of modules. And so far, we've got, you know, it's pretty early days. We've already got, here's a selection of some modules that are out there already. Mo the majority of these are created by the community, not by the core team. 
Um, so we've got kind of like database stuff, like NoSQL stuff, like MongoDB, Redis. Um, we've got uh, SQL stuff, like MySQL and Postgres. We've got Spring integration stuff, um, various other stuff. Uh, Nodine is worth mentioning. Nodine's a really interesting module. It's not complete yet, but Nodine is drop-in Node.js compatibility for Vertex. So the idea there is you'll be able to run your, uh, your Node.js applications directly on Vertex without changing anything. Because obviously right now, you know, Vertex um, doesn't copy the, you know, we're not a clone of Node.js. We have different APIs currently. Um, so the idea of that, we want to kind of give a kind of springboard onto the kind of what we think is the better world of Vertex. So you can say you're already a shop using Node.js. We can take your, your existing application and then introduce you to all the kind of nice goodies in Vertex you don't get in Node.js. And also introduce you to the other languages so you're not confined to JavaScript anymore. And another, another module that's worth mentioning there is Rx Java. So I said earlier that kind of what, one of the criticisms people have of asynchronous APIs you, you must have heard of like you know callback hell, you know, the pyramid of doom, various other things. There are various approaches you know that you can use to mitigate against that. Um, we've accepted that we can't use, we're not going to go down the continuation route, so we need some other way of doing it. And the kind of most promising ways are kind of either promises, using a, some sort of promise API, or taking that a step further to kind of like an Rx API. And if you're not familiar with Rx, Rx Java is a uh, project by Netflix, and it was um, basically modeled on Rx um, library from Microsoft. And it's all about composing. And actually, in the previous, um, the keynote before, um, when he was talking about streams of data and composing streams of data, it's all about doing that, basically. Um, so it's a really nice little library. It's a way of basically you know, getting rid of the, the callback hell, basically. And I think um, Richard Warburton down there has been working on another promises library as well. OK. Yeah, so the last thing I say on modules, and I'll just give you a little demo as well. A, a new feature in Vertex is what we call a f um, fat jars. We support fat jars now. And what is a fat jar? A fat jar is when you take your application and all its dependencies, all its jar dependencies, and stick them all inside a single jar, a single executable Java jar, so you can just copy that to a server that's got a JDK installed in it. That's all it needs to have installed. You don't need to have any of the Vertex binaries pre-installed. And then you just run it Java minus jar. And this is kind of fashionable at the moment. Um, I think uh, Drop Wizard is one framework that's been using it, quite, you know, kind of pioneered that approach. Um, so, but we support that now, too. Um, that's kind of nice. Some DevOps really like that kind of thing. Right? So let's actually try doing that, shall we? And I should say, um, before I um, go into that demo, Vertex Core, I said before, is very, you know, it's a very low overhead. Into, I think um, the two jars in Vertex are 120K and 600K. So Vertex itself is a very small footprint. Um, we have two, in terms of jar dependency, the Vertex jar dependency is a Netty, um, Hazelcast, which is optional dependency, it depends if you want to use clustering or not, and Jason, uh, Jackson for JSON. And that brings the overhead for all the, all the vertex dependencies to about 4.6 megabytes, which is a, fairly small. Right, so let's try and create a fat jar. So in the previous, previous example, we, we ran this hello module, which was a groovy module, right? A groovy hello world module. So let's convert that. Oops. Um, let's convert that to a um, to a fat jar. And the way you do that, all you do is say vertex fat jar, the name of the module. OK. And there it is. Now we have a jar. As you can see, it's 4.7 megabytes in size, not, not particularly big. And you can just run that. So you can now copy that to a machine that doesn't have Vertex installed in it, just has it on, it's got a JDK. And then you just go Java minus jar, hello, mod jar. OK. Let's go back to our browser, F5, and as you can see, it's still running, so it executed it. So that's a kind of cool new feature of Vertex. OK. Um, HA, high availability. Another new thing in Vertex, well, kind of just after Vertex 2.0, but it's available now in the latest release of Vertex. 
HA. So what do I mean by HA? Um, I mean the ability for your application to continue to function after the failure of one or more nodes at the back end. So we support automatic failover of modules. So you can deploy you know, a couple of node, well, multiple nodes on your, server, on your server side, and if one of those nodes fails, another node is going to take over. You can also group those nodes into logical groups. So you could say this application only fails over between this subset of nodes and this other application in this other subset of nodes. And another thing we support with the HA is uh, network partition or split brain detection, um, which we use uh, Quorum to do that. Um, I won't go into, I'm sure most of you un understand the, you're familiar with the computer science behind that. It's a well known technique in distributed systems. Um, and you can look that up, that up online if you want. Um, but I'll show you a demo. So, um, right, so let's delete that mod directory from before. And I'm going to copy over this other directory. Right, so we have, um, we have a new mods directory now, and I've got a couple of pre-prepared modules in there that I prepared earlier. And we've got what we have there. It's basically the same, if you remember the event bus example from before, when we had a vertical sending stuff in the event bus, publishing it to that news feed. We've got two more modules, one written in Groovy, one written in Python this time, that basically do exactly the same thing. We'll take a quick, quick look at them first. I have vertex Groovy. Um, less sender.groovy. And it's, it's the same example we had before. I think it was in Java before. And it's just going to publish news from Groovy to the news feed. And let's have a look at the other one. The other one's a Python module. And doing the same thing, just saying news from Python. So let's run those. So vertex uh, run mod, IO vertex. Uh, so let's run the groovy sender first. Now this time, so how are we going to enable HA? Because HA is not enabled by default. Um, so all you do is you put minus HA on the command line. That's it. Okay, no, no complicated configurations of clusters and XML files and all that stuff. It's just H, minus HA. OK. And let's do the same with the Python module. Python sender 1.0. And again, we'll, do, we'll put minus HA on the command line. Let it start up. Now, we, got to, we need to check that we, st oh, we need the bridge running as well. Because what we want to do, we want to see it coming into the um, client-side JavaScript again. So let's run that again. We're running that web, um, web server. OK, go back to the browser, F5. And there you can see, those two modules are now sending it stuff to the same topic, if you like, and it's being picked up, which is pretty much what we did before. OK, so now let's do something a bit more interesting. Let's um, kill one of those nodes. So. Uh, PS orcs. Let's find out the process ID of the groovy one. Oh, it's gone off the top of the page. Um, three nine two four. Right. So kill minus nine three nine two four. Let's we'll go back to the other. You can see it's been killed. And you can see the other node has now taken over that module. It's redeployed that module automatically. So we've now got one, instead of having two JVM instances before, we've now got one, but it's now running both those vertical instances. OK, and if you go back to the browser, you can see, just F5 again, you can see it's still, they're both still running. OK, so that was failover. Let's do something even better. Let's, um, let's start up a empty vertex node that's not actually running anything. And you can do that with vertex, so vertex minus HA. That's just an empty JVM. Well, apart from the, not empty JVM, but it's not running any verticals at the moment. Um, and let's um, now, so now we've got one vertex process running both those verticals and one process running no verticals. 
So let's kill the um, kill the one that's running those two verticals. Okay, so find out the process ID for that one. And that was originally the Python one, wasn't it? So that should tell us the. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, this. Uh, oh, I've got so much. Okay, I know what. Python sender. Right, 3984. So let's kill that one. 93984. And you can see that node's died. And you flicking over to the other one, the empty one, you can see now it's redeployed those two verticals. So if we go to the browser, you can see, refresh, they're still running. Okay, so that's high availability. Um, and you can do kind of cooler things when you get into quorums as well. Um, but I won't go into that now. OK. The, the last thing I want to talk about in the talk today, um, how much time we've got left? I could do a performance demo if we've got enough time. Probably not. Um, is developing with Vertex. So one thing, in Vertex 1.0, we kind of, the developer experience is kind of rough. We hadn't put much of any effort into kind of working well with build tools or with IDEs. So one of the things we've done in Vertex 2, we made, um, put quite a lot of effort into kind of having a good story for, for build tools and IDEs. In particular, um, so for example, with, with IDEs, I mean, you, I mean Vertex is, is IDE agnostic. You don't have to use an IDE if you don't want, but probably most people, certainly in the Java world, tend to use IDEs. Um, so we've you know, we've put a lot of effort into allowing you to like, do the whole kind of test, debug, seamless test debugging in IDEs um, with, you know, Eclipse and IntelliJ specifically in, in particular. Um, I think it should work in NetBeans too, but we haven't really done, put a lot of time into that. The other thing we've put quite a lot of effort into is um, into playing well with Maven, because most Java developers in particular, almost every Java developer uses Maven these days, um, or Gradle. Um, so we have a kind of set of Maven targets, or tasks, and also for Gradle. And we have a Maven archetype. So you can basically create a Maven skeleton vertex Maven project. It's all set up to go immediately with a Maven archetype, just one line, and it's bam, it's there. And similarly with Gradle, we have a Gradle template project in GitHub. You just clone that and get started with Gradle straight away. And um, one really nice feature um, that we've implemented is module auto redeploy during development. So the idea there is you can have a module running in the background and you can be playing away inside um, your IDE, change something, save it, automatically redeploys and updates in the running application. And I'll just show you that as the final demo. So, um, right, so let's go to directory. I have a directory here. Auto redeploy hello. Right, so this is a Gradle project created from the Gradle template project that basically creates a vertex module. And I'll just show you that actually in the IDE. Um, oh, clicked the wrong one. Yeah, and there it is. Basically, it's just, again, um, the same example from before event bus published to the newsfeed. And this one is written Ruby this time. And it's just going to say some news from Ruby. So let's run that. So I can actually run it um, from the command line using this Gradle, um, by executing Gradle, and there's a Gradle tar target called run mod idea, which is for running a module when it's inside IntelliJ idea. And I use minus i, that's a, a um, Gradle switch, which otherwise it swallows all the output. OK, it takes a few seconds to start up. And when it started up, let's go back to the browser, F5. And there we go. It took a little while to start up. It's not, you can see it's saying some news from Ruby as well now. So we've also got, the, as well as the two other verticals that are still running in the background, we've got the one running in the ID now, also sending to the same um, event bus address. So let's change something. Let's go back to the IDE. Let's say some more news from Ruby. And I'll just save it. OK. Go back to, and there we go. It's updated very quickly. 
this is kind of really good for the whole develop, you know, so it helps your whole kind of development cycle, of kind of prototyping stuff especially. This is another cool feature um, in Vertex 2. Okay, and that's pretty much it. So um, I'll summarize really where we are. So the Vertex allows you to write your apps to a set of loosely coupled components. This is kind of the Vertex way of doing things. Um, living in different places in your network, potentially. Um, potentially written in different languages. You don't have to write them in different languages, but if you want to, you may have good reasons for doing that. Um, talking to each other over this event bus. So no application servers, right? So you're running stuff directly in different nodes. Obviously, it's polyglot. You can use, you can... Um, choose what language you use depending on the skill set of your team or the task at hand. So, for instance, one common pattern that we find is people might use, say, a scripting language like JavaScript for kind of the glue code, you know, coordinating stuff, and then maybe use a statically typed language like Java or Scala for maybe the more complicated stuff they want the benefits of static typing for. Um, we have a very simple concurrency model, very similar to the actor model, um, which allows you to, you know, avoid a whole load of race conditions that you might bump into and, some, and deadlock and stuff like that. You might bump into with more traditional Java multi-threaded concurrency. Um, we have a new module system that we want to encourage the reuse of modules. Um, basically, hopefully ends up with a nice ecosystem, kind of similar to the Node.js NPM ecosystem, I guess. High availability, an important feature for your, your um, production applications. And ease of development, of course. We want the um, developer experience to be as, as simple as possible. And that's basically it. Um, so, you know, uh, we have a very small team still. Um, it is growing, um, but it's still pretty small. So if you want to get involved, please get involved. There's loads more to do. The project obviously has a huge scope because it's so, it's so general purpose. You know, we can there, you potentially write modules for anything under the sun. So there's a huge amount of scope, loads to do. One thing we want to do, the kind of next step, is to kind of start defining a set of blueprints for Vertex. Because one of the things that sometimes developers find confusing about Vertex, they're coming along, because it's so unopinionated, they, might, they, might, they, will, they come along and say, how do I write a web application with Vertex? It's like, well, you can, it's up to you, basically. We don't tell you how to do that, right? You could, it's such a low, more of a low-level platform. So we want a set of blueprints where you can say, where you can say I'm, I'm writing a REST application. How do I do that? And it's, it might say, oh, you can use this module, this module, and this module to do that. Oh, I'm writing a real-time web application. You can use this module, this module. to so kind of like a set of recipes of how to piece things together to write your different types of application using Vertex. Um, so yeah, if you want to get involved, basically, you know, clone us on GitHub. Uh, the Google group is where all the discussion occurs. And we have an IRC channel as well uh, where most of us hang out most of the time. The question is, how do you unit test a vertical? So we have, um, Vertex actually has a, its own test framework that we wrote specifically for testing verticals and modules. Um, and it's basically, because a lot of um, you know, common test frameworks aren't very well suited for asynchronous testing. They kind of tend to assume everything happens on the same thread, and you end up having to use like countdown latches and you know, nasty stuff like that in order to coordinate your test and, and then kind of pass results between threads, and it's kind of ugly. So we wrote our own, um, our own test framework, which is, which is basically for, um, specifically designed for that. So, we, so it should be fairly straightforward. And that's supported in, and we kind of work to make that well supported inside IDE, so you can seamlessly run that in IDEs too. And that is basically it. So yeah, thank you very much for um, listening.